Okay, well, we are live, and I am super excited to be joined by my good friend, the big daddy himself, Michael Erickson Fasheen from Ad Badger. So, Michael, thank you for joining us on this PPC AMA, where we're going to help some folks uh, improve their PPC campaigns. What's going on, Kevin? I hope all is well and that things are good and that uh, you're having a fantastic day. And uh, I hope everyone out there in the internet is also having a, all of those things. Well, I can, I can guarantee I'm having a good day. All of the above is true. And I'm pretty sure everyone in the internet world is having a good day too. And so we're going to be answering your questions about PPC. We are with uh, um, someone who I have come to respect a lot when it comes to PPC. Um, I use a lot of his calculations that he's shown me over the years when I do my own campaigns. So very excited to have him here. So I'll let Michael introduce himself here in just a moment, but just to make sure that everyone can hear us okay, um, do me a favor, say where you're from, where, where are you from? So this was ahead of time. It's like she was uh, time traveling into the future. And rather than you know going back in the live stream, she went ahead in the live stream and knew we were going to ask this. So Tiffany, uh, hello from Tiffany sh from Chicago. Uh, this She commented this while we were still counting down. So uh, I'm joining us from Palm City, Florida. And Michael, where are you joining us from? Austin, Texas. Austin, in Texas. House. Yes. In the house. The the home of the Hook'em Horns. Got the cowboy hat in the other room. You got that cowboy hat in the other room? <laughs> in the nice, other room. nice. Yeah. Uh, the, I, I, I love the, the Hook'em Horn Texans, although I... Of the Longhorns, I should say. Um, I say that with somewhat jest because uh, I went to Texas Tech, Ooh, which wow. we did that? beat UT this past year in football. It was the first year we beat UT and Oklahoma in the same year. And they're leaving soon to go to the SEC. So that may never happen again. So. <laughs> <laughs> but it was fun. It was fun. So um, anyway, so folks will be joining us and telling us where they're from. Uh, Nuwal says, hi guys, hope you're doing well. Uh, Izaz, hopefully I said that right, says hello to you mentors with a clap emoji. Uh, Karan says, joining us from Toronto, Canada. Blaine says from La, ba La Paz, Baja, Mexico. Um, uh, greetings from Pakistan, Pakistan. Oops. Brett is joining us from Southern Cal. Hello, Brett from Southern Cal. Izaz is joining us from China. Wow. Wow. That's uh, interesting. Um, and then Nawal is also joining us from Pakistan. So a couple of things to keep in mind. Uh, this is a AMA. Uh, I want to respect the time of Michael. Uh, we brought him on early just so we could check microphones and then sit through the uh, the countdown timer and all that fun stuff. So we have the, we have the same microphone. We do. Oh, we do. Is it the <clears throat> Blue Yeti? Test, test, one, two. Oh, yeah. Test, test, one, two. Yeah. The, uh, I got the uh, dark gray version. I see. Oh, what color is yours? Black. Oh, oh black. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Well, nice. Well, we're super excited to have you, Michael. So if you want to ask Michael a question... You got to put it in the chat, whether you're on uh, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitch, wherever. Make sure you put it into the chat. And we go pretty much first come, first serve. Although I do reserve the right to switch it around if I want. Uh, just because maybe a question pops out that seems timely or whatever the case is. So we'll do our best to get to everyone's questions. But every week we run out of time. And so when I brought up the fact I want to respect Michael's time, uh, we will be cutting off so that Michael can get to whatever else he has after our scheduled in time. So um, on that note, um, I did want to come back to Tiffany. I don't know if you're still here, but Tiffany joining us from Chicago. If you email Kevin at myamazonguy.com, I will get you VIP access to the PPC Mastery Summit, which I'm hosting. And Michael is one of our all-star speakers and for those of you who are like, yeah, but I, I, I want to get access to the summit. The good news is you can still grab a ticket by going to ppcmasterysummits.com. Grab a ticket now while you still can, because if you're watching this after Thursday afternoon, tickets will no longer be on sale. So enough of that. Michael, tell us a little bit more about you as I was catching you mid-drink. Yes. Well, <clears throat> I was born on a stormy night in New Jersey. <laughs> 
many, many years ago. Uh, and many decades later, I started freelancing as a digital marketer. Uh, I found mm. a lot of joy in the problem solving, in the service component. I really enjoyed helping people and learning about their companies and seeing what I can do for them. Mm -hmm. And I was doing a lot of Google ads like 10 years ago. And I was really lucky because I had a client that was like, hey, I also want to sell on Amazon. And this is like before it got cool, before you started to see uh, people in Ferraris in your Instagram feed telling sure. you to start an Amazon FBA business uh, to get instant riches. So like it was, I, I was doing Amazon ads before it was cool. And I'm really thankful to have that experience because I've been able to play with Google ads for a very long time and Amazon ads and Facebook ads for a very long time. I think I got to add TikTok ads to the mix uh, just to sort of get exposure and keep on going well. about it. And it's been super fun to help people see so many different things. Um, I have a Google ads agency, searchscientists.com, and I've got an Amazon ads software tool at adbadger.com, and I do a bunch of stuff in the space. I really enjoy it. It's fun. Mm -hmm. Kevin, you're part of it. I just like the community. Uh, I think there's a lot of good people in there trying to do really interesting things, trying to push it forward to ultimately help our clients. So I really enjoy it. What else? No, that's good. That's good. And, you know, as a someone who's a former teacher, you're very good at teaching things and explaining what can be sometimes very difficult concepts in a very simple, easy to follow manner. And you make very good, what, what would we call it, a poem or a haiku or poem, uh, a sonnet? Yeah. <laughs> I like to, I like to uh, incorporate moments of Shakespeare into my life. Yes. And so yes. <laughs> yes. And you put together as always at the beginning of your presentations for the summits that I host, you always put together a good, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, rhyme yeah. um, of some sort. And this one was, uh, no different and it was definitely interesting. So Kevin, I'm a big believer. If I'm not having fun, nobody is. So, there, there you go. We should all have fun. It yes. is contagious. Yes. <laughs> So if you want to check out Michael's um, sonnet, poem, haiku, I probably butchered all of them. Poems, probably the, the closest thing. Uh, <laughs> then head on over to ppcmasterysummit.com, grab a ticket for less than $10. I paid more for popcorn the other night at the movies, I think with taxes and all What that. did you was, see? Uh, we saw Mario. I took my daughter. Nice. Yes. Yes. It was uh, it was fun, and then at the end of the movie, these kids came in, and like probably early to mid teens, and they're being loud. And then at one point, they like, I think they were throwing it at each other. Okay. And it was like candy or something, and like it. it hit us. So I went running to the manager. I was like, you you need to take care of this. And it was like, as soon as I, I kind of mentioned there were kids in the theater, they were acting up. He knew exactly who they were and where to go. So I'm sorry. I had to go through that. It must've been on the radar. Yes. I'm sorry that you and your child had to go through that. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So enough of that. Let's get into it. Um, so we'll go ahead and bring up a question here. Um, I did have a, uh, couple people said congrats to Tiffany. So that's very nice of you, Hamza. And Tiffany also had said um, that she thanked us. Oh, awesome. That was it. Uh, I've got a lot of comments here trying to sift through. Um, but yeah, as someone else said, Michael is insane, man. How can I train myself to think like Michael? Let's start with that question. Oh, that's a good one. I'm skipping ahead, but that's a good one to start with. What a, I'm, what a wonderful question to receive that I, <laughs> that, uh, you know, I imagine here in sane in the same way that we would say sick or something like that. Uh, so yes. So how do you train yourself to think like Michael? Here's the answer. You can look up, uh, in education. Funny enough, when you make a lesson plan, uh -huh. you have these standards that go along with it or these action items that you would like the student to walk away with. And these, oh, are, okay. these are action items that use words like the student will understand or mm -hmm. the student will be able to create 
or the student will be able to synthesize or evaluate or discern like all of these action words. Mm -hmm. And if you look at these action words from most rudimentary, simple to most advanced, that's how you sort of want to scaffold your learning. Um, so if you want, you could search hierarchy of education objectives and mm. you sort of see this thing called bloom's taxonomy and bloom's taxonomy uh, i had an episode on the podcast one time where i sort of broke this down for the amazon space where at the base level you're just remembering stuff oh somebody said something mm -hmm. i'm just going to remember that i don't even mm -hmm. know why it does what it does then you move up a little further and you move to understanding okay mm. he, somebody said something i understand why that is and then you can start applying it and then you could begin to analyze and then you could begin to evaluate and then you create your own strategies for it. It's called Bloom's Taxonomy. And it's a big way that I try to think about Amazon PPC, Amazon marketing education, because it really breaks it down. I think so many people are stuck with the remember. OK, somebody says something. I'm going to remember that mm. and I'm going to do that in my account without really understanding why mm -hmm. it is the way that it is. Because one thing I firmly believe is that no matter what I say today in terms of a PPC tip or whatever, uh, it's going to be different for everybody. So really being able to create your own strategy is the pinnacle of the educational pyramid that we should all be climbing towards to how to take information that you read, get exposed to, and create your own game plan for your own company and all of the unique components of it. It's one of the hardest cognitive things to do so it takes a lot of time uh to do but somebody want to know how to think like me and there's the answer that's how you do it oh also massive oh. anxiety to always be thinking about this stuff like oh man i gotta worry about this so that that helps too <laughs> right so hopefully folks can avoid the massive yes. anxiety but <laughs> yeah. we do have sometimes passion for things that we get uh overly yes uh carried away into thought Probably yes. is the way to phrase it. So I, I uh, can't tell you how many times I'll go on a run and be like, oh, that'd be a really cool thing to do <laughs> about something involving work. So, yeah, I, I do enjoy the stuff. Nice. Nice. Mm -hmm. Definitely shows. All right. So let's get into some questions. So um, as I mentioned before, this is first come, first serve for the most part. Um, I do reserve the right to go a little bit out of order if need be, but I'm starting here at the beginning. And so if you want your question to be answered, to be noticed, uh, best thing to do is get it in early. So I would start getting it in now. We have quite a few questions already queued up. And like I said, every week in this live stream, we run out of time. So uh, we want to get to as many questions as possible. Uh, but I also want to give Michael the freedom to answer them however he feels is the correct way to answer it, which may be quick or maybe take a little bit of time. So <laughs> thank you. Uh, so that way on the Bloom's taxonomy, he can help you go from just yes. uh, remembering to understanding and then mastering so that you can apply yes. it yourself. Kevin, I need a lot of creative latitude. That's <laughs> the thing go. to know about there me. Yes. Go. All right. So what is a tangible and actionable way? Um, I like that being actionable in our answer here uh, that we can interpret uh, brand metrics data and brand impression share in the campaign manager console, along with brand analytics search query performance to make calculated decisions. And then they went on a little bit more in brand metrics. We can see our category conversion data um, from brand analytics, search query performance. We can see search level uh, conversion data. Then what does business report unit session tell us? Is it all encompassing? It was, cool. it was, uh, it was kind of like, you know, like when you watch the uh, uh, regardless of, who, who's in office it always is like this where you, you watch the white house press briefing and it's like this like multi-level very good question but it's like i'll let it's you unpack. Of, yeah, <laughs> yeah i'll let you decide how to unpack all that yes let's it was so big we had a, it, the streaming software had to split up a tooth everything right so first of all this might be the question of the hour uh this is such mm. a fantastic question it's so good. And Karen, you should feel really good for trying to piece together something that is so uh, difficult to understand. So basically, here's the thing. As a digital marketer, no matter what you do, you're always looking for more data. Mm -hmm. Data on data on data on data, different reports on different reports. And I've always said, 
even if you had access to every single thing that ever happened involving your product, even if you had a list of every single search, every single person who clicked on it, every single second that they were on your page, how long it took someone to view it, what percentage they scrolled, even if you had access to all that information, it would still be incredibly difficult to get actionable insight out of it. What do I do with all of this stuff? Um, so you're spot on with your question about like, okay, we have all this new data. What do we do with it? Now on Amazon, there's something very frustrating with it is that for whatever reason, uh, Amazon really likes this concept of like, uh, two pizza teams. Have you ever heard this? Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. I read, uh, the yeah. book about Jeff Bezos. Yeah. Or I'll like, let you explain two pizza teams for those who don't know. So like they only want teams to work that are big enough to be fed with two pizzas. Granted, I could eat one pizza all by myself. Right. Um, exactly. That, that could be subjective. But, you know, <laughs> right. You get you get snack. you get two slices only. So right. they they really like this concept of small, small teams, which is fantastic for a lot of reasons. But it's frustrating for a lot of reasons, too, because what you end up with is this sort of information silo where different teams are maybe analyzing data differently. So you're absolutely right. Why don't we have conversion rate as we no define conversion rate in most places mm. inside a business report? Where, why do we have this thing called unit session percentage in a business report? But over here we have conversion rate. Why is it that on the search query performance dashboard, I see metrics that do not align with my PPC metrics? You know, Why is it that my PPC metrics say that I got 30,000 impressions for a search term. And then I look at search query performance and it says I got 6,000 impressions. You know, why does the data so incongruent? Uh, I don't know this for a fact. This is speculation. Uh, but could it be because all these teams are defining data and doing things slightly different than other teams? Uh, mm -hmm. I feel strong about that idea where it's like, is that happening? You know, the difference, the discrepancy that you get from a search term report, looking at how many orders you got for a search term versus the search query performance report, uh, those are very different numbers oftentimes. And it's like leaves you wondering, you know, I have conversion rate, unit session percentage, search query performance tells me this, my search terms tells me this, like all this data, it's like kind of weird. So as we move into the third part of this answer, the thing that I would say is you want to be able to start with the end in mind. So what is the end in mind? You want to be able to increase sales over time. So how does all this information in all these different places turn into something that you can do? So the first thing that I will say is when you're looking at your PPC metrics, this is how I use it. When you look at PPC metrics and your data, you look at it, it's either good or it's bad based off your assessment. My ACoS is too high. My ACoS is too low. My total ACoS is too high. My total ACoS is too low. I want to scale a revenue. No matter what it is that you want to do, you look at your PPC data. Before you take any actions on your PPC data, before you start to say, I need to increase budgets or change bids or launch more campaigns or do this or do that or the other thing, pick any of these reports, you know, brand metrics, search career performance, organic ranking reports, whatever it is, and try to put your PPC data in an overall context. Try to get a sense. Uh, you also didn't mention Product Opportunity Explorer. I like to mm -hmm. look at Product Opportunity Explorer here too. Uh, in fact, that's probably my first one to put things into context. Uh, brand Metrics is my sort of second choice to put things into context. And then Search Query Performance. Uh, and the action that I'm talking about is actually my last thing that I look at. So basically what I'm trying to do is if my A cost last month was good and now it's bad. Like let's say it was at 25% last month and now it's at 33%. Oh man, like that sucks. Like why did it go up? The first thing I want to do is see what the market did and see how I compare to the rest of the market. Because that's going to inform what I do. Is the market shrinking? Is the market changing? Was there fewer search volume? Was Did a competitor gain on me? All of these things will help me make better decisions in my PPC campaigns. As an example, let's say that there's a, you know, competitor. Okay, what about that competitor that gained ground? Oh, they dramatically reduced their pricing. Now I can use that to mm. inform my next step. Oh, they gained ranking on X number of keywords. You can use that to inform your next step. Oh, it looks like they went harder on certain keywords and it led to an overall brand lift for them. Oh, I can use that in my... Uh, 
actions. The conversion rate on brand brand metrics tells me something. My competitors are converting better. I should go optimize my product page to get it to convert better. So the thing that I like to do with all of these metrics is put it in a global context so that you're not creating any false optimizations where you're making a change in your PPC campaigns, but it's actually not the right change because you don't have context to the overall mm. market. So this little feedback loop that I'm describing, I think is a key thing that separates a paint by numbers type PPC -er and someone who's like really good at it because they know, mm. oh, this is changing because of this market factor. We're going to take this action. If you can do that, you become an advanced marketer in no time mm -hmm. versus somebody that just looks at the PPC campaigns, just hammering away at stuff mm -hmm. with no context. So I answered a lot of that question. There's maybe some more there, but like I said, this is a phenomenal question that unpacks a lot of what I think are advanced concepts. Yeah. And that's true. And it's going back to what you said. Sometimes we want the paint by number, the here's the easy answer to it, you know, do this, do that. But going back to the taxonomy we talked about before um, bloom bloom. bloom bloom. Okay. Bloom's taxonomy. We don't want to just remember things and have like, okay, I remember this is my to do. It's understanding the bigger picture so that you can, you know, have more mastery to it. Yeah. Love it. All right. So Jalil asks, um, what is your opinion and experience when using expanded product targeting? Do you feel that this targeting type gives you good data also, have you utilized the data it gives you? And then what is your opinion on product launch without using um, auto campaigns until wheel, which might be week two or three? If you're confident in your SEO and your SEO keyword heavy, is this strategy still a good one to follow? Yeah. So, yeah, th this is an interesting one. So should you use blank? Uh, is how is the category of question that this is like, should you use blank? Uh, you know, should you use auto campaigns? Should you use this? Should you use that? Should you use the other thing? The answer is almost always yes for anything uh, in the sense of if you look at very large advertisers, very successful Amazon companies, they are typically doing everything. Uh, there's typically no stone that they haven't unturned. Uh, so th as a general principle, should you use blank? Yes. Should you use blank early? Yes. So it doesn't matter specifically what the thing is. You should probably use it now. Will everything before perform the same way? No. So again, this is like, do you paint by numbers here? Do you just like, okay, launch this campaign because here I go because I'm supposed to. No. Like you always want to do everything all the time. So like that being said, you want to prioritize it. So do I prioritize expanded product targeting? No, that's probably not like the first, second, third or fourth thing that I'll launch for a product that's brand new. Um, so uh, I'll answer this question by talking generally about it. Uh, anytime you do PPC search based or display based targeting, you have the option to be really specific with your targeting or be more broad with your targeting. And it's a spectrum, right? Some things are more broad than others. Broad match is more broad than phrase match. Phrase match is more broad than exact match. So anytime you do this, you are pushing and pulling certain metrics. You're trading specificity for visibility. And generally you're trading conversion rate for visibility. Now, traffic is fantastic. You need traffic uh, so if you are struggling to get more volume, then you want to go on a more broad perspective. So that's where expanded product targeting is useful. Um, is it my first choice? Like, am I in love with expanded product targeting? Not really. Uh, I've called it like expanded ASIN targeting, um, uh, which can be good. Like I don't hate broad match. I think it serves a time and a place. So the thing that I'll really say is what is my opinion of it? I think I gave my opinion. Uh, what's my experience of it? Uh, does it be, so I think the thing that happens a lot with Amazon PPC is like everyone always expects everything to perform the exact same way, even though there's intended, there's different 
intended purposes on the sales funnel. So expanded product targeting, you should not expect to convert like your top of search exact match single keyword campaigns for sponsored products. You shouldn't expect it to perform like your sponsored brand video campaigns or your category targeting. So like all these things perform differently. And again, when I run campaigns, every campaign has its own specific intention, own specific target A cost. Why am I running it? How much do I want to spend on the broader type targeting? How much do I want to spend on the more exact type targeting? And it changes over time. So if my campaign is doing really well, I will want to uh, go search for volume. Like if I have a very low A cost, I want more volume. I want more sales. I'm willing to, to increase my A cost to get more sales. So I think I've beat this question to the ground. Uh, <laughs> um, in terms of Jaleel's second question, uh, this is also related to the other thing. Like, should you launch with auto campaigns until week two, two or three uh, if you're confident in your SEO and your SEO keyword heavy? Um, so again, auto campaigns, your mileage may vary when it comes to launching products. Again, the answer, should you do blank? Uh, you should do all the things. So there are certain times where it works better or worse, which is why like PPC is really just a feedback loop. So like if you were to launch with auto campaigns, you would want to see very, very quickly how they're behaving in mm -hmm. the context of your exact campaigns and your broad campaigns and all these different things. And so it's not about like, should you do this? I've seen plenty of times where launching with auto campaigns hits really good. Uh, Amazon really knows the product. The product page is well optimized. The brand is really strong. There's a good brand history. And they hit it great with auto campaigns out of the gate. Other products, brand new brand, sort of little brand recognition, they run auto campaigns and it's absolutely awful at search. So I, I would say those are two dis discerning factors that you can use to determine if you should use auto campaigns when you launch. But my overall principle is like, should you do the thing? Yes. And then you look at it, reflect, you have an intention when you launch it. Test it out. I could have just said that. <laughs> well, no, because you're trying to help yeah. people get to a higher level mm -hmm. of the taxonomy. Yes. We're yes. in the, yes, for sure. All right, cool. So, next question How many keywords should I have per campaign for my exact broad phrase match campaigns? And what should be the search volume criteria on uh, third party tools for each of the keywords to separate them into different campaigns? If that's even your strategy, Michael, I'll let you uh, take it from there. Yeah, I, I love this question. I love campaign structure. Campaign structure, I think, is one of the trickiest things to get down. Mm -hmm. The first thing that I'll say is campaign structure is another thing that you optimize over time. Mm. So, for example, even if you threw all of your keywords in a mixed bag in one campaign, you had 400 keywords in a campaign, mixed match types, mixed search volumes, doesn't matter. Versus if you did everything perfect, you were so meticulous, you put low volume terms over here, you put high volume terms over there, you segmented your match types, you did all this stuff beautifully. No matter what you do will be imperfect towards your goals. You're going to mm. have all these weird things. So what are the weird things to look for? The weird things to look for are, do you see any products or keywords getting throttled in some way? So for example, maybe you have 10 keywords and like the bottom four keywords should have impressions. They should have search volume. Sometimes plucking those out, putting those into a new campaign will reinvigorate those uh, keywords and you'll start to get traffic on them. Uh, do you struggle with sort of splitting budget differently? Because even if you have, you segment by search volume here, you segment by match type, you might end up with certain product ads or certain placements for certain keywords or certain keywords just outperforming the other ones that maybe they don't belong in that particular campaign. You know, Maybe they're pulling up the average too much and maybe you have other things that are pulling down the average too much. So whenever I have a campaign, I really like to be specific about the target goal or the target ROAS of that campaign. And when you have a campaign, even if there's just two keywords, so like if we think of something that's fairly segmented, two keywords only, same match type, two product ads in it. If I open up that campaign, and I notice weirdness like, hey, this one keyword is always showing up in top of search, doing great. This other keyword just isn't doing well at top of search or, uh, you know, hey, the conversion rate for this one product is really good versus this other product. That's a cause for se segmentation. So I can split those out into a new campaign. Mm. So I will say it doesn't even matter what you start with. Just look at it. 
optimize it over time. Now, this person did ask for recommendations, so I'll give them some, uh, depending on your budget. And then it really only matters if you have a gigantic budget. Yeah, like you would want to segment your campaigns into like low volume, medium volume, high volume, top of mountain pinnacle volume goes into a single keyword campaign and just sort of put all the keywords into a spreadsheet and just do some really quick like, What's the bottom 33%? What's the mid 33%? What's the top 33%? It's going to be different for every industry. Some people have super high volume industries. Some have low volume industries. So that's the best, most correct way to do it. Uh, and then do I segment match types? Always uh, into separate campaigns? Always. Uh, so hopefully that answers your question. Oh, that was good. All right. So which bidding strategy is best to use? Mm, fantastic question. Uh, so... This one, I do have a little bit more specific recommendation. The thing that I will say is that if you have a campaign that gets 30 or more uh, orders a month, so like one mm -hmm. per day, if you have a campaign that gets 30 or more, I really like to do it 60 or more. If you get 60 or more, I like to do up and down. I like to get a little nuts with it. I like to get a little bit more aggressive with it. Uh, anything below that... Uh, at one point in my life, I was doing fixed, um, but I started to prefer if it's got less than 60 orders a month or less than 30 orders a month, uh, I'll sometimes I'll, I'm putting that in down only more and more mm. uh, just to sort of be a little bit more conservative with my lower volume mm, campaigns. That's probably a good idea. I, and I know a lot of people like to use fixed bids because it gives them control. But at the same time, too, I, I kind of look at it as like, if Amazon will let me spend less money, why not let them let me spend less money? Yeah. You know, I think there's other areas to get more aggressive. So like mm -hmm. if launching fixed bids, you know, you can get one campaign out. But if you launch two campaigns with down only, you might be able to get a net higher amount of traffic. So I like to get aggressive in other ways, particularly with just like launching lots of campaigns like if I can launch 50 campaigns for a product, uh, you know, I'm like a kid in a candy store because you get to launch so many different things for so many different reasons and have different goals. Um, so that's general. That's a general rule. However, I do need to call Hassan uh, out. There is no best mm. strategy. What will work in one campaign uh, with one account with one marketplace is very likely not going to be copy paste to the next one. Uh, so really, the answer is like, you know, you want there's general principles that you use. And I gave you one, but that, you know, best, worst. Yeah. I don't like those. I don't like to think like but that. That is a good point because to your point, not even necessarily just between different accounts or different marketplaces, you know, Canada versus us, you could have different results for same product, two different campaigns. And so you might have to just do it a little differently. Yeah. Here, here's a good example. Your plural version of this keyword is doing great. Your singular version of the keyword is doing awful explain that yeah because they're yeah. supposed to be the same thing mm -hmm. to amazon so it yeah sometimes it just doesn't make sense how the algorithm comes to its decisions mm -hmm. um all right so brett asks do you have suggestions on how to handle one click zero sales on broad match campaigns by themselves they're cheap but together they get expensive i seem to get a lot of these this is a, a softball question that kind of tees up what you were talking about at the ppc summits <sighs> Uh, yeah. So the literal answer is, uh, we've talked about it on our podcast. Uh, you can go to the PVC mastery summit. I go really into detail about this concept. Uh, but yes, this is very much a softball question because, uh, I'll explain a little bit of the concept, mm -hmm. you know, uh, most search terms, if you look at where the data comes from on your search term, then you sort it by spend. Let's say I want to find things with spend with no orders and you sort that you'll see not that many things spending over $20. You know, mm -hmm. if you do, you'll negate them. You come back a month later. Now you have almost nothing that's spending over $20 without an order, but like 50% of your budget has no orders. And it's all made up of these like one click. Yeah. Onesie twosies here mm -hmm. and there. So basically what you want to do is you want to take, let's say you have a, uh, you know, a common word in all these terms. So like, let's say, you know, red shoes and then like shoes for men, red or like mm. shoes for women, red 
kids shoes red. And then you begin to see like all these terms only got one click, but red everywhere where red is, is doing awful. Like red mm -hmm. in a whole bunch of different terms was in a hundred different search terms. It spent a hundred bucks without any orders. That is an example of Ngram analysis. Mm -hmm. And I actually talked literally about this topic. It's one of my favorite things. I think it's so simple. Uh, it's really powerful. It's easy to do. It's something you could do on a routine. People learn about it and they're like, that's amazing. Um, so yeah, for, at the PPC Mastery Summit, I shared a spreadsheet uh, so that people could do their own Ngram analysis. It's great. Yeah, and it is it is so true because you, know, you get stuck with these little onesie twosies and sometimes it's the word red, but you know, by themselves, it just it never shows up if you're doing filters or if you're sorting or whatever you're doing um, because it's all these little ones. So finding the commonalities, you, you, you had a good system for that. So, and I'm not just saying that because we're plugging the summit. I'm saying this because I thought it was super helpful. Um, all right. So Sundar says, hi, I have a doubt. Could you please help me sort this out? Consider we have around 10 variety of products under the same category. 10 variety comes under same keywords uh, category. What will be your approach to promote them? So let's just assume these are parent child variations mm -hmm. or something very similar where they're sharing a lot of the same keywords. Yeah. Right. Like imagine how many, if I'm Nike, how many terms, right. How many running shoes apply mm. to my, like how many products do I have? where running shoes applies mm -hmm. to everything or basketball shoes apply mm. to everything. Right. An insane yeah, amount. Even if they're not parent child. Yeah. An insane amount. Oh, exactly. Like, yeah. So an insane amount of things. So there's a lot of nuance in this question. The first thing is uh, business goals. So there might be business goals. Maybe you have inventory that you want to move more than others. You know, you're just sitting on this inventory. You're like, man, I really need to move this variation or this product mm -hmm. using this generic term that applies to many things. So then you might go and you might organize your campaigns in a way to funnel more of that traffic to the things that you need to move. Um, so that's like the inventory component mm -hmm. of this question. Then you have the performance part of this question. So from a pure ROAS perspective, well, mm -hmm. just funnel the traffic to the very best converting highest volume thing like go get the most sales the most profitable sales so maybe you want the volume so you go to the one that has you know maybe the most clicks the most potential sales potential if you want the profitability maybe you just serve it to the thing that's the most profitable so this is more like a business level decision than it is a ppc one because you have your business goals and that informs the ppc strategy not the other way around um most of the time uh so in this case yeah if you have that and if you don't have a goal if you're just sort of like yeah we just move an inventory things are just moving it doesn't truly matter exactly what bubbles up to the search results then it's totally fine and totally appropriate to have that term to have all these things trigger um from a structural component sometimes it makes sense to put all these products together in one campaign um, and there's a sort of like natural rotation that comes through and then you can sort of look at that and see, oh, this bottom variation, you know, isn't getting any clicks. Maybe I'll want to change that up. I'll break it out and I'll put it somewhere uh, to maybe give it some more visibility, give it its own budget to see how it does on a whole scale. The activity that I really like to do here is product sum analysis. So basically if I have that product in 20 different campaigns, mm -hmm. what's the A cost and conversion rate? Mm. for that product what's the revenue per click for that product and then you know you can look at all the products like that um and you can compare you could say wow this product everywhere it does it does so good um so yeah so look at duplicate search from reports uh, i like to do that uh, look at some product reports i like to do that uh to but I, ultimately i think it's a business level decision awesome so next question comes in. What is the best practice to use sponsor display ads with different bid optimizations, cost per click versus the VCPM uh, versus reach, which mm -hmm. the reach and the VCPM, isn't that the same mm -hmm. one? Like, yeah. So this is an interesting thing. Uh, Can you explain VCPM just real quick? Yeah, let's do it. So the 
CPM. So we all know CPC. It stands for cost per click. Very easy to understand. You pay when somebody clicks on it. VCPM. So CPM stands for cost per mile, uh, as, as in millimeter, as in mile, meaning a thousand, like mm -hmm. a, you know, or in milliliter, it stands for thousandths mm -hmm. of a liter. Here we're talking about a million what? We're talking about a million and uh, million. It's very confusing. A mile. Yes. As in uh, 1,000 thousand impressions. Yes. As in thousand, not million. Uh, so CPM is the price you will pay for a thousand impressions, mm -hmm. meaning you can get a thousand impressions and pay for five dollars and no one could click on it. So just mm. FYI. Now the V here is supposed to stand for like viewed or visible or somebody actually saw it um, because it could load all the way down at the bottom of the page, paying CPM and nobody actually saw it. So you're paying for these sort of ghost impressions. Uh, Amazon says, don't worry, we won't do that to you. And if somebody will actually have to see it now. Did they actually see it? Potentially not, potentially yes. Maybe it loaded like on, you know, for so short a time they didn't actually see it. Um, so VCPM, I think, is one of the biggest pitfalls. So here's the thing. If you take a look at, uh, like, AppBatcher has, like, a 1,100 marketplaces on it. The click-based ACoS for sponsored brands and sponsored products is, like, 29%, 30%. The click-based ACoS for sponsored display is, like, 60%. 60%. Now, I cannot tell you the amount of people that look at their VCPM campaigns and look at the VCPM ACoS and the VCPM is like 5% ACoS. Why is it so low? Because you're getting credit for just loading on the page, not necessarily clicking on it. So what's best practice? The best practice is really a strategic decision. So getting the reach, really going out there and serving your ads in these different places. Again, my big principle, should you do the thing? Yes, probably. Uh, so should you use VCPM? Yes, probably. It's not my first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. It's not my first choices when I run campaigns. But after I nail down my good direct response, click-based conversions, and I'm looking for additional volume, I'm looking for additional volume on my very best products, VCPM all of a sudden becomes a good choice because it'll give you lots of volume in positions and ad slots where maybe you wouldn't have gotten otherwise. And then because I have such good performance on a product because I was so meticulous with all my other campaigns, now all of a sudden I can add this reach-based campaign and expand it out. And it's paid for by all the other good stuff that I have running for that product. So I don't know if you can, if you gather this, Kevin, I, I think being very meticulous, what am I launching? Why am I launching it? Can I launch it? Like, is the performance for all my other campaigns good enough that I can afford to launch a campaign that's going to have an average of 60% ACoS? And hopefully I make up volume, I get more brand recognition, I get more reviews, you know, I'm feeding the cycle. So it's all about being intentional, strategic. Why am I launching it? If people don't have a target ACoS in their campaign names, they need to start doing it. So when you launch a VCPM, you have to literally write target ACoS two times whatever your click-based ACoS is for your other mm. campaigns. And if you're not willing, like if your average ACoS is 40%, can you launch a VCPM campaign knowing that it will probably be at like an 80% click-based ACoS? Uh, so be intentional about everything. Yeah, and you know it's interesting because... With ad platforms in general, you kind of get what you ask for. Meaning like Facebook has always kind of been like, if you want conversions, they'll do their best to get you conversions. If you want clicks, they'll do their best to give you clicks. If you just want reach, they'll just give you reach. If you want views to a video, they'll give you views to a video. Mm -hmm. So you have to be careful with that. But yeah. I think truly all ad platforms, whether they bill it to you this way or not, they're looking at it at a cost per, or probably for them, it's probably art. RPM revenue per mm, mil. Yeah. And so Amazon, it's revenue, I think, not just of, you know, how much revenue they get off of a thousand impressions 
for sales, but also plus what they're going to make off of clicks in total. So you might not show up at all if they're not going to make any money either because they, they want to make sales. Facebook, Google, Amazon definitely spends more time thinking about how to maximize their revenue per second of the day mm -hmm. than they do like giving us uh, ad tools or marketing. Right. Tools. Yeah, for sure. They've got it down. That's that's like where all the science is going. It's like, okay, an average customer on Amazon ends up buying something within five minutes. How do we make that four minutes? How do we make that one second? Like just like log in buy. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's interesting where it's all going. So, all right. Next question comes up. Hello, one of my exact keywords is taking the most impression and sales. So I just made a new campaign with just that keyword. Do you think that's a good strategy? Strike Club. What great. I, I yeah. like the name. Yeah, yeah that's a good I, one. I want to say maybe Muay Thai. Um, <laughs> so Strike Club, this is a brilliant thing. Uh, you can think of this as just normal keyword or search term graduation. You have something doing really well. I mentioned earlier that campaign structure is a moving thing that you optimize over time. So when you have something bubble up, it's taking a lot of impressions, taking a lot of sales. You want to move that somewhere else. Where we're going to have its own dedicated budget, its own dedicated top of search bid. Uh, yes. So absolutely. This is great for sure. Awesome. All right. Next question comes in. It has been seven days and my Amazon A plus and brand story are still in the submitted status. Is there any way to hasten this process? It's really hurting my conversion. I'm a new brand. Uh, truth be told, I don't spend a lot of time building brand stores. Uh, I don't know too much about this process. Um, I'm not the best person to ask. I would definitely recommend if it's still on Friday, not coming through, you could always come to our live stream with Jason Master Mateo, who's one of our uh, senior group account directors. He knows his stuff sideways, forward, backwards, how to push stuff through. So I would recommend that. Uh, you can also book a coaching call if you go to um, myamazonguy.com forward slash coaching or coach, one of the two, I should know off the top of my head, but either coach or coaching uh, will take you to the page where you can book a coaching call if you'd like with uh, one of our experts to help you with that. And sometimes you just got to also just pester Amazon. Hey, just want to check on this, you know, and because chances are the first person you contact seller support, they're going to copy and paste something that makes absolutely no sense to what you just wrote. And then the next person may half read it and then still kind of do the same thing. And then the next person might be someone who actually knows what they're doing and is going to go out of their way to help you. But sometimes you don't get that person right away. All right. So next up. Strike Club also asked, this is not at all PPC related, but I added a variation to my product and I noticed that the reviews are not getting combined. Could you help how I can make the reviews combined? Um, yeah, so this is actually, uh, I've talked to Stephen Pope a lot mm -hmm. about this, uh, both like on the show and uh, talked to clients about having this happen. Uh, I, I'm not an expert in this, but it seems like it happens and it's very frustrating. I think what they do is like they just read, like they resubmit it again and again. And it's also weird. We've had a lot of clients where their variations have been getting split up. They're like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, this is horrible. Um, so that's happened. And they just, I think they just go and like resubmit it several times. I'm not an expert in this. Yeah. Another thing I would also check is make sure when you click on the, the link, that it's going to the right product detail page. I've seen it in some accounts where it looks in your managed inventory like everything is aligned like it should, like here's your parent and everything else is falling underneath that. But then in reality, what's showing to customers are different parentages. It doesn't happen often, but sometimes it happens if the catalog team or somebody with a vendor central account randomly decides to change the parentage on their own. Um, and so that could be a problem too, but yeah, sometimes just try resubmitting it, putting in a case. Um, and sometimes on Amazon, there's just not really good reasons why things are the way they are. Um, feel free to book a coaching call with our team. If we can help you uh, more with that as well. 
but yeah, it is frustrating when stuff like that happens. And then OAIS also asked, I overbid my keywords by almost two X and have a daily budget of over a hundred dollars, but my ads are barely being shown. Any thoughts on why this is the case? I'm a new brand. Yeah, this is a tough spot to be in. So the first thing I would do is see if you're indexed for these keywords anywhere. Um, that's an important thing to, to begin with. Um, you know, be, begin to make sure that your product page is optimized for these terms. Uh, that could be very useful. Because um, ultimately, when you bid on a keyword, it's not just your bid. Uh, your bid is sort of multiplied. Uh, on Google Ads, they call it quality score. On Facebook, they call it relevance score, where it's basically like, how relevant are you for the search? And a lot of time, and like, how do you become relevant for a keyword? And there's a couple different ways to do this, but really the biggest answer is when you appear for this, do you have a comparable click-through rate to your competitors for that search? And Amazon factors in a lot of stuff when they do this comparableness. So it's not as if, if you're in position 10, you need to beat the click-through rate of the person in position one. They sort of know what your click-through rate should kind of be at position 10 compared to the people at position nine and position 11. You should be somewhere over there. And if you have a better click-through rate than, you know, other people, you'll sort of be rewarded with more visibility. So a lot of times when this happens, it's either because you're bidding on something that you're not indexed for, the page isn't optimized for those keywords. And worse, if you were indexed and you are optimized for that keyword on a product page, on page SEO component, and then you still don't get lots of clicks, it is potentially very likely that you did get served, but maybe it's a product title thing. Maybe it's a pricing thing. Maybe it's an image thing. And then you want to approach this from a click-through rate perspective to see if you can increase the click-through rate. Um, so those are all components that, uh, that's my sort of checklist to work my way through there. Awesome. And I think we got time for one more question. So let me pick a good one. A month after launch, we're at 29% tacos. Is it too soon to lay off and aim for profit? We prioritize growth, but without profit, our inventory orders won't grow. Ooh, it's a this. good conundrum to bring up. Yeah. So a couple of things to consider. The first thing I would do is I would put this 29% ACOS, your spend, your sales. I'd put this into an overall context with the market. So the thing that I would do first is how much market penetration did we get in that month at a 29% ACoS? And what I would hope is in a good case scenario, you've got a lot of market penetration, meaning you're able to look at competitors and like your organic rankings are somewhat comparable. Um, you know, your amount of orders is somewhat comparable. So hopefully you've like made it into the industry and you've landed and maybe you're like a, you know, top, 10, 15 product for a lot of these uh, searches that would come up. If the answer is no, eh, then you obviously can't sustain probably an unprofitable total ACoS for a very long time. So what I would generally recommend is like shrink your focus. So maybe if you have a 29% ACoS, it's possible that there are nooks and crannies of your account that have better ACoS than others. So Generally, at this point, we try to go harder on things that convert better to gain ground. Maybe you go harder, you get more aggressive on just certain parts of your campaign, and maybe you scale some other things back. So it's never, you don't have to think of things like so binary, like, oh, we're either like pushing for revenue or we're pushing for profit, or we have to scale back. You can kind of like fluctuate the levels here where you can sort of say like, these keywords are worth investing more in. My favorite kind of keywords to do that are like mid and low tier keywords, keywords that the top competitors forgot about, and maybe they're not so optimized for, where you could get more specific for those terms. So maybe you're boosting your click-through rate for you know those terms. Maybe you're going harder on those terms. And then maybe some other terms, you're decreasing your aggressiveness down. 
uh, which will allow you to maybe get a little bit more profit from them, but you're pushing other areas where you can have a higher opportunity to grow. So those are some considerations that I would make. Um, and to your point, like, is it too early or, or this, that, or the other thing? Some of that is business goals. You know, some people launch with lots of money in their war chest. They can do it for a very long time. Other people need profitability sooner. And, you know, it's, it's really about, I, I think it's so valuable as a PPC or or like when you put your PPC hat on and you begin to work on your PPC and you're asking questions like how much should we be spending? What's a good A cost for us? What should our target A cost be? Our total A cost be? You ask all these questions, try to connect the dots there of like, what is my business goal and what, how does it inform my PPC strategy? It's a very nuanced thing that takes some experience, but sort of like really map it out. Like what is your business goal? And then try to plug in a PPC strategy that fits into it. Love it. All right. So that was good. Lots of good uh, taking us up the, the taxonomy, as we learned about earlier in this, for not just having remembering, but really understanding and then having mastery, which is my crude um, summary of what you described earlier with teaching folks. So on that note, if somebody wanted to learn more and get their taxon taxonomy, not taxes, but their taxonomy, meaning their level of understanding to a higher level, uh, where would you like them to go? Yeah, you can go to adbadger.com slash podcast. Uh, we have like 250 episodes about Amazon advertising and we go, we've gone really deep on a lot of topics. Awesome. And I was super excited to learn even before we hit the, uh, thing to go live that, uh, you had uh, utilized one of my testimonials at the top of the page. So I was uh, excited to be there. So I, I am a fan of the Ad Badger podcast. So I definitely recommend folks uh, go check it out. And you'll, you'll see what I have to say when you go to adbadger.com forward slash podcast. Yes. So great stuff there. So yes. um, if you're in the PPC Mastery Summit, you will see uh, Michael there. Um, if you are not in the PPC Mastery Summit, go grab your ticket. Uh, somebody commented that they sent me an email that they had uh, misspelled their email and had a login issue. I will get to that. I'm kind of back to back for the next two hours, but that will be taken care of today. And don't worry, we will make sure to take good care of you. Um, and with that, thank you so much, Michael, for sharing your knowledge as always. And for everyone else, we'll see you on the next one.